I read somewhere that the standard plot for a Hollywood rom-com is about the stalker who gets a girl, and I mean, they weren't wrong. Think Edward in Twilight. How did you know where I was? Did you follow me? Ted and Pat, and there's something about Mary. Looking for some lady friend you knew back in school. Yeah. And Noah in The Notebook. Do you remember me? The love interest is often a horrible human being, at least 50% of the time. Think Chuck in Gossip Girl, and of course, they will throw in random moments of decency to distract us from their awfulness. And by the end of the show or movie, love will have transformed them into a good person. The end. Generalizing here, of course. Behaviors that would often end in arrest in real life are often portrayed as romantic and passion and being crazy about each other. More on that later because I have some things to say. And look, I'm not bashing it. You know, the average relationship simply is not interesting for a film premise. I get it. If it were, you know, that's what we would see. Instead, rom-coms are fiction. And while older viewers are better at discerning fiction from reality, younger viewers, not as much. I mean, I remember little me using the exact lines from the OC when communicating with my crushes. In my pursuit of unpacking some of the common themes that we see on TV, I unexpectedly found some answers to why many may not be finding love or at least finding happiness in their relationships. So let's talk about that. You know when you lock eyes with someone across a crowded room and you just know instantly that they are the one? A moment later, you are accidentally pushed into them and you go, Oh, I'm so sorry, and it turns into a brief conversation and you just don't want it to end. And those fireworks he's giving you is something you've never felt before and he must be a chemist, you think to yourself. It's not just gas, you're sure of it, it's something special. A poll revealed that overall, 61% of women and 72% of men think the concept of love at first sight is real. It also showed that between the ages of 18 to 29, 90% of women believed in it and 84% of men. That number drastically changes between the ages of 30 to 39, where only 56% of women believed in it. Here is what you guys thought when I asked you on Instagram. Now, despite this, most psychologists agree that the feeling is not in fact love, but rather immediate physical attraction, including things like the way this person looks at you and the sound of their voice. In one study, strangers were more likely to report experiencing love at first sight with physically attractive people. In fact, one rating higher in attractiveness on the scale that the researchers used corresponded with a nine times greater likelihood that other would report that electric love at first sight feeling. It's a physical sexual high, a dopamine and serotonin explosion, making your brain look like that of someone who's high on heroin. So really another word for it could be lust at first sight or infatuation, which can be described as a strong feeling of attraction, fascination, and fixation towards someone, often without really knowing them very well. Although it often seems very intense, infatuation tends to be based more on physical attraction and an imagined feeling fantasy about this person and who they are. It can also involve rejecting information that goes against this fantasy, such as ignoring red flags or early signs of incompatibility. Now, why is this worth bringing up? Because we often get swept away by this idea that if it's not love at first sight, then it's not love. And so, you know, we may be dismissing any potential love interest that doesn't give us that feeling even though those initial fireworks say nothing about whether or not we will be compatible with that person. And while love at first sight can lead to something long-lasting, the odds are apparently against it. Why? Because that physical sexual high are things that change as time goes by and because that initial spark often makes it feel like all the other pieces will easily fall into place, when in reality it takes a whole lot more than a shakily feeling in your body to make a relationship work. And now you may be thinking, but I know of people who swear that it was love at first sight, and I've even experienced it myself. And absolutely, that can be true, but studies show that love at first sight is often not reciprocal, and we may remember it in a way that wasn't exactly true. It may be that only one party felt the spark and jump-started the relationship, and then as time passed, mutual love grew. But the narrative of the relationship is reconstructed so that love at first sight was actually reciprocal. So there is a thing called positive evolution in psychology, which is a story that couples tell each other, creating a confabulated memory that adds meaning and uniqueness to the relationship, meaning that 
you and your partner may think that you fell in love immediately because of the way that you feel about each other months or years later. Let's take a quick break to talk about the one time that I experienced love at first sight. So it was about two years ago and it was when I tried out Skillshare for the very first time and I just knew that I would never want to be without it ever again. We started talking, they said they would love to help me out with my channel by sponsoring my videos such as today's video and I said yes, I would love for more people to know about them and so here we are. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of inspiring classes for anyone who loves learning. And with each class that you take, you can connect with other like-minded people who are taking the same classes. Personally, the reason Skillshare is my go-to for learning is because it doesn't feel like I'm just taking a class because I need to learn something, but rather it feels like I'm just watching a cool person talk about something that they are super passionate about while I'm learning and growing at the same time. I recently took this class called Becoming Creative, an artistic guide to creativity held by Brent Eviston and taking this class left me with some actionable steps that I can take to sort of refine myself as a creator, which I think is something that a lot of artists can struggle with sometimes. I highly recommend checking out Skillshare. I personally have gotten tons of value out of it for these couple years that I've been using it and the first thousand of my subscribers to click the link in the description box will get a one month free trial of Skillshare so that you can start exploring your creativity today. Remember I said rom-coms are about the stalker who gets the girl, so let's take The Notebook as an example. You know, a classic. Ali and Noah are both at a carnival, and their first words of exchange are when Noah asks her if she would like to dance with him, to which she said no. Why? Because I don't want to. He continues to stare at her as she walks off and rides the Ferris wheel with another guy. He follows them, continues to stare at her, and takes it upon himself to dangle from the ride with one hand, threatening to slip until she agrees to go out with him. So I read the comments on that specific clip on YouTube and the reactions are mixed. You know, some people think that his behavior is just not romantic at all and creepy at best, while others expressed a nostalgia for a time when grand romantic gestures like that seem to have been the norm. So my belief is that those who deem it romantic may do so because, well, it's fiction. And we know the plot of the film, you know, we know that Noah is not a psychopath who was out to hurt her, and we as the audience know that they are meant to end up together. In real life, we obviously don't have that information about someone who approaches us. It also doesn't hurt that Ryan Gosling is a conventionally attractive dude. And there's also this thing called the dobler damer theory. There's a fine line between love and insanity. It's the dobler dahmer theory. If both people are into each other, a big romantic gesture works. But if one person isn't into the other, the same gesture comes off serial killer crazy. So my take on this is that in real life, if someone is interested in going out with you, they will agree to you. And if they're not, they won't. And if they are, but they say they're not, well, why would you want to go out with someone who is not communicating their wants in a honest, proper manner anyway? Believing in a soulmate is believing that there is a one and only person who one is destined to be with forever and who is waiting for you. The assumption that you and your soulmate are two puzzle pieces when finding each other will align in perfect harmony. While an attractive notion, the general consensus within the psychological community is that soulmates are for the most part an imaginary concept steeped in romantic idealism with no pairing perfect or meant to be. Yet one survey showed that 88% of people believe in the idea of soulmates in a different poll, however, 81% of women rejected the idea of a soulmate and instead believed in the possibility of more than one potentially well-suited partner. And here is what you guys thought when I asked you on Instagram. Author and psychologist Tai Chiro said that the problem with soulmates is that people tend to think that fate is responsible for producing them, while the reality is that enduring love is a byproduct of intentional clear thought and action, as well as a healthy dose of persistence. Couples that approach love as a journey are happier than those who consider it a destination research has shown. More reason to leave the notion of soulmates to the movies and romance novels. I like what Sabrina Romanoff wrote for Bloomis Health, where she said that replace the idea of finding your soulmate with creating one through years of learning about them and navigating challenges and creating a family and loving each other through all the happy and hard times. Now why does this matter? 
Well, for a variety of reasons. So for one, psychologists have found two scales that influence how we start and maintain relationships. One that measures how much we value first impressions and early signs of compatibility, and one that measures how likely we are to work through problems in relationships. Soulmate believers may feel very intensely and passionately about a partner at first, but as soon as problems inevitably arise, they are convinced it's because they're not meant to be and that person is not their true match because the true match would be perfectly compatible. They're also more likely to, for example, abandon or ghost a partner because they believe that you either click with someone or you don't and you should just move on. So what you may get as a result are intense but short-lived relationships. On the other hand, people who believe in relationship growth are more willing to work and grow with their partner and to tackle conflicts as they arise. Though they may not feel as intensely or passionately in the beginning stages, their relationships tend to last longer and be more satisfying over time since they don't reject a partner over minor disagreements but rather seek to evolve together and to grow a satisfying relationship. And this whole soulmate thing is also, I believe, a case of confirmation bias. You know, when you're with someone who you're happy with, it's easy to proclaim that they are your soulmate, but the reality is that you could probably be equally as happy with someone else in the world. If soulmates exist, they are made and fashioned after a lifetime partnership, a lifetime shared dealing with common duties, enduring pain, and of course, knowing joy. So my personal thoughts on this is that I don't believe that there is a person out there who at birth was assigned to be our other half. I believe that we meet people through life who we connect with in a special way, either immediately or through time, and whether that person remains in our lives or not, they'll always have played an important role in it, in shaping who we are. It doesn't need to be romantic either, it could be platonic, so I don't know, you know, perhaps there are several or several soulmates. In film, doing everything for a person is romanticized, even if you've known each other for like no time at all. Like, did you know that Romeo and Juliet knew each other for four days? From the time they met to the time of their tragic ends? In fact, Romeo and Juliet is a perfect example of the all-consuming type of love that we often see. You know, somehow the more struggles and fighting and back and forth that you go and the more intense the makeup is in between all the fire the more passionate the couple and the more we melt you know watching them being crazy about each other the notebook again is a great example of this where noah and ali would constantly be fighting pretty brutally yet they always made up and found a way back to each other except for one time when they broke up and they were apart for a year and Ali was with someone else who she cheated on to be with Noah and somehow we're supposed to be rooting for them still. Again, for entertainment purposes, which is the purpose, it's great. And I would watch it again, you know, and obviously the ending is very heartwarming where Noah ends up taking care of Ali as they grow old together. What are your thoughts on all of this?